So good morning, everyone. My name is Rodrigo Lopez. I am the director of P20 Initiatives at Illinois, uh, Northern Illinois University. Um, I have the great pleasure to also be working on the NIU Illinois CT project in collaboration with the Illinois State Board of Education. Um, but I also lead um, alongside Dr. Jason Klein, who's joining, joining us here today, the Illinois P20 Network. Um, I also do want to take a quick second to acknowledge our other um, colleague, um, Mr. Ben Owen, who is also part of the uh, CTE project here at NIU and works alongside our uh, colleagues at uh, ISB. Um, I don't see if, uh, I don't believe anyone from ISB is here, they were going to try and join us, but if they do, I will probably take a quick second to go ahead and not only acknowledge them, but give them a little bit of time to go ahead and introduce themselves, maybe say a few words. Um, I have spoken a little bit about the sign-in form, so for those that just recently joined us, I'm going to go ahead and do that again. If you can please take a quick second to uh, sign in, we'd love to know who is joining us for these um, events. Um, and lastly, uh, if you could, um, before I turn it over to uh, Bill Rose to introduce himself, uh, if you could introduce yourselves uh, via the chat box, um, that would be great. Um, so at this time, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to Bill. Bill? Hello, everyone. My name is Bill Rose, and I am uh, one of the new members of the NIU Illinois CTE project. Uh, I'm taking the role as a, a CTE educator on that team. And we are just really excited to uh, really move forward with some of the career connected Illinois efforts. And so uh, one of those efforts is making sure that all of our students throughout the state this summer, uh, we launched a summer speaker series that focused on ensuring access to and success in CTE classrooms. Uh, this was based on a focus on special populations and non-traditional careers of the Perkins Five Act. Um, so uh, we, we've touched on uh, three main ideas around the Perkins Five Act, which is family and community engagement and post-secondary placement. The second one is active recruitment of special populations into CT programs and non-traditional careers. And then the third one, was the elimination of barriers for individual CTE students. Uh, for each topic, we had a keynote speaker uh, that basically presented uh, with an educator panel to learn more about these specific strategies and best practices. Um, this second part of that, uh, those discussions is actually taking a look from individual panelists throughout the state um, that, are do that are doing this kind of work. And so, um, uh, we, we have two speakers, but before I get to them, just wanted to recognize Dr. Amanda Bistoni from CAST, who was the, uh, lead of this topic, uh, a few weeks ago and really presented some compelling information about, uh, UDL and universal design learning. And so, um, it was just such an amazing presentation as an educator. There were things that I didn't even know, uh, that she was bringing up using the UDL um, focus. So, um, so we're going to go ahead and introduce our panelists for today's uh, speaker series, and I'll turn it over to Ninja, and then uh, we'll have Craig go. Hi, good morning. Thanks for having me here today. My name is Ninia Adrizi. I'm one of the associate principals at Barrington High School. I oversee teaching and learning, but I'm also one of the teachers in our education program, CTE certified in developing the career pathway for education. We are running uh, like the state of Illinois suggesting or recommending with the early education path, which has been very well developed at Barrington High School. And now we're adding the secondary and or basically the education path, which I oversee and hopefully will speak to that. Um, Barrington High School is also in collaboration with Equal Opportunity School since about 2015. So a lot of the outreach programs we have for our underrepresented students in that regards, we are mimicking for our CTE program. So thanks for having me here this morning. Thank you. Hi, right, and I'm Craig Stenberg. Uh, I'm in uh, the Rockford Public School District, uh, District 205. I teach at Jefferson High School. Um, I am the, uh, the engineering pathway instructor as well as the computer science pathway instructor here, wow. uh, which has a real nice synergy between those, those, two, uh, those two areas. And um, 
I'm looking forward to sharing some some insights on, on how I uh, recruit students and, and, and bring students into those those pathways. Thank you both for being here. And uh, again, if you have not uh, placed a, an introduction in the chat, if you're a participant uh, just watching, go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. And uh, that way everyone can see uh, those, those statements. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started on, uh, you know, a few of the questions that were that we've presented. And one of the ones that specifically I, I like is, you know, does your school or district have a direct policy initiative on how opportunities and CTE programs are communicated to special populations? And we'll, why don't we start with Craig and then we'll go to Ninja. So we have district-wide as well as um, school-wide initiatives um, in place. Um, Rockford Public Schools has uh, been uh, working in the academy uh, model uh, for quite a few years now. And so as part of that um, structure, um, the district has an academy expo that is a, an event where students um, from all, all the high schools in the district um, uh, hop on buses and arrive at a, a central location. Um, the location varies from year to year. Sometimes it's at the big convention center downtown where the, you know, the Rockford Ice Hogs play and other years it's, it's in other spots. But um, bottom line is uh, this, this event is a huge event um, and it's, it, it's really unique because it brings the entire community um, together. And so it's the community that is showcasing um, the various uh, careers, uh, the, their, you know, what they do within, within their individual businesses and how that relates to um, the academies in general and specifically um, CT uh, within the high school. So the students are, are introduced to that um, early on. And then as the year progresses, um, the schools have individual um, um, academy um, a pathway, I guess more pathway specific um, uh, showcases uh, where in, in the library, um, you know, typically here at my, my high school, but, you know, the other high schools in the district, you know, may have it in another another area and maybe the field house, wherever that might, might work uh, best. And this is where the teachers and the students, the upper level students, um, can actually, you know, really showcase what's going on in their, in their CTE uh, classes. And so um, that's where, um, at these more um, building level events, that's where the students really get, um, you know, the opportunity to uh, dig deeper, um, ask the questions that they need to ask, and, um, you know, get introduced not only to what the classes offer, um, but be able to talk one-on-one -on -one with the other, the other upper class students uh, to really see if, if CTE is for them. And I have found that the uh, Academy showcases have been really the number one uh, way for, for recruiting for my students. Uh, I have students, you know, talking years after they've, they've gone to the, the Academy showcase uh, or the Pathway sh uh, uh, showcase. Um, and they're still talking about that event and, and how much they learn and how much they, they like that and how much they're looking forward to some of the things, um, you know, down the road that we, we discussed or that they heard about at that, that, um, that showcase. Um, and then on, on a more individual teacher level, um, you know, so you know, I've kind of started with the district, the building, and now just sort of on, on a more personal level, um, I have um, after school clubs that I um, introduce um, all the different aspects of the CTE curriculum to. So I have an underwater robotics team, an aerial robotics team, a land robotics team. Um, I have 
and I know, you know sometimes people get a little confused. I have an environmental club, and you know sometimes they say, "Well, gee, why, why do you have an environmental club? You know, shouldn't that be environmental science?" Well, I have a background in environmental science as well, um, but the one thing I like to, to point out is that, and a lot of my students have mentioned this: why don't we change the name of the environmental club to environmental engineering, uh, which is a valid, which is a valid uh, request, um, but we haven't we haven't gone and, and taken that that leap yet to change change the, the name officially. But you know, what, one of the things that we focus on in the environmental club is that they have the opportunity to borrow the equipment from the aerial robotics team, the underwater robotics team, the land robotics team, um, the architecture club uh, that we have, you know, borrow some of that equipment and, and use it um, for environmental um, research. And so we do actual field research. We'll, we'll fly drones. We'll take the underwater robot. Um, one time we had a, a, a partnership project where the underwater robotics team, who is um, just wrapping up their season as, as far as um, the competition season that, that they have. Um, and so they had a little bit more time on their hands. And, and and we had a, a, a after school meeting where we had the environmental club and the underwater robotics team meet together and brainstorm and design together a new robot for cleaning rivers and lakes. Um, and so being able to you know, grab floating trash as well as um, underwater um, you know, trash that is, is sunk to the bottom. And, and right. through, through these clubs, oh yeah, Bill, Craig, so we're going to get into some of that a little oh, bit yeah, longer absolutely. into it. So I'd like to give uh, uh, Ninja a chance to answer. Uh, and then uh, I'm I'm really excited because I know some of the work that you're doing uh, at the school district, and we're going to get into that a little bit more. So uh, Ninja, uh, we're going to go back, go over to you. Do, does your school district have a direct policy or initiative where um, you are uh, communicating to special populations? So the policy we have in place, we have the Board of Education on board with our equity work. So there's definitely the support at the board level there, um, but we don't have an, a direct policy for the recruitment or communication in that regards, but we have plenty of initiatives. So I wanted to share with you some of the things we are doing. If you look at Barrington High School on the website, Ben Rodriguez is our assistant principal. He oversees CTE. He has done a tremendous job of posting videos, interviewing the students, and really highlighting the CTE programs we have at the school. So right there, students have it can see it, it's on Twitter, Instagram, and then especially when the course selection process is happening, that's when the outreach starts. Before I come to the outreach, I also wanna mimic what Craig said because we also have a showcase night. We um, offer the incubator program and usually when pitch night is at end of April, we are combining that night with all of our CTE programs and have a showcase night. So all of our CTE programs are throughout the school. So before pitch night starts, which is a highlight of that evening because our students usually receive quite a bit of funding from the community to get their inventions up and running, is that all CTE classes are there highlighting the projects they have worked on and showing off. Since it's end of April, many of them are moving towards their final projects and seeing that. That's also the time where we have a lot of students coming in who see their older siblings present, and that is a way to recruit and get the students into the building. The students can talk to the teachers and which is way more popular not talking to me, but it's having a student right there with me introducing the project and asking questions. That's really when the highlight is coming and the recruitment is starting. Now to target the special um, populations, we are really following something where we had to do a little bit of a shift in our course guide. Our CTE classes now all have the weight on let me rephrase it. Every single CTE class, which is a post high school experience, receives a higher grade on the GPA. So Barrington High School is very college oriented and that's something we wanna shift and really open it to college and career ready. But in order to do so, we put all CTE courses which have post high school experience at the equal level to dual credit and equal level to AP classes. 
So there alone, the students were very interested in that. And that's how we are reaching out to our students to look at that potential. So for our, um, so first we created the, first we created um, that change. And then we are looking at our underrepresented students. Underrepresented students we are defining as a student of color or low socioeconomic status. So that's our special population group we are recruiting and we're moving out. So we're looking, do they have the grit to challenge yourself through a social emotional survey? Um, do they have the test scores, a teacher recommendation? Any of them, if one of those clicks in, we are reaching out to them and we are recruiting them to take a post high school class, which falls into all or more the majority of our CTE classes. We have one-on-one -on -one conversations with them with a trusted adult. The trusted adults they have also identified through a social emotional survey. So the trusted adult reaches out to them and says, hey, you would like to go into this career path. What is your interest? And they are recruiting our students um, into those programs and into the career pathway. And even though they might not jump right into the highest level of that course, they're putting them on track to become successful in that program. I, I was just taking notes, Ninja. Th those initiatives just sound amazing, uh, especially addressing the SEL components of, of students and uh, special populations. We're going to move on to our uh, second question, and we'll start with uh, you, Ninja. In this regard, the second question is, who leads the recruitment of students into CTE programs? And I really liked the component that Craig brought up about looking at it from a district district level, school level, and then kind of a personal level. So if, if you could kind of touch on that uh, from, from your school district. Um, I know my name when you say it is so much more fun, but the J is like a Y. So it's Nina. Nina, I'm sorry. Don't worry, I like the way you say it. I think in the recruitment, it's an all-in model. We need to value the programs we offer and we need to support the students to go in. So it goes from all the way up top from the Board of Education when they are allocating funding to all the way down to the students within the class who welcome their new classmates into the class. So it's all in. Leading that is a lot of our assistant principal, Ben Rodriguez, the department chairs going along with it. And then Craig, you know, I was, I was a German teacher and recruitment and the teacher really is everything. When you have that personality and you put yourself out there and you're in the homecoming parade and you are on the first day of school and you're standing out and you're in the hallways reading the students, that what makes a difference and that what draws students in. Craig, did you have a follow-up on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I would just say, you know, as far as who really leads the recruitment, I would say that, you know, um, the support is, is from the district level all the way, you know, through the buildings and, and to the teachers. But ultimately, it, it, is, it is teachers um, that lead that recruitment initiative. Um, you know, it, it's, it's really um, that um, individual dynamic um, that, that I think is the most important, um, you know, to the recruitment. Um, and, and, and I'll say that the teachers with the support of the community um, members really have, have made a huge difference, at least in the Rockford Public Schools. One of the things I, I, I didn't mention before, but um, I kind of wanted to get to, and I'll just mention it real briefly here, is that, um, one of the, the teacher initiatives in the CTE department here at, at, at Jefferson High School was to bring um, a, a women in engineering um, uh, initiative. And it was, it was teacher started, uh, myself and, and, and uh, several of the other uh, of the CTE teachers, um, you know, came to the building you know, um, level administration and said, hey, this is what we'd like to do. And they said, hey, great, let's let's go and get, um, let's get um, that, the ball rolling on that. And so basically what we were able to do is we were able to get engineers, uh, female engineers from around uh, the city uh, to come in and have a panel discussion in the auditorium. Um, all the female students, uh, freshmen, female students, um, got a, a ticket, a pass to, to head down 
um, to the, uh, the panel discussion. Um, after the panel discussion, there were um, smaller, you know, like one-on-one -on -one type um, question and answer sessions and breakout rooms where uh, the female students had the opportunity to um, ask further questions. And what breakout room they went to was based on surveys that they completed at the end of the large panel discussion. So, um, so that was a great event. Um, and, and again, that was um, teacher um, started and then ultimately supported um, all the way up to ultimately all the way up to the district level. Craig, I, I think uh, one of the things that kind of sticks out with with that initiative is not only is it the women engineers group, uh, I believe there's another group, women of, of today's manufacturing yep. has stepped up in that area and, and done recruitment and they are very active in the schools. And so um, that that component I think is key when, whenever you're looking at uh, getting special populations or uh, looking for students in those non-traditional uh, roles. And so uh, I appreciate you sharing that because I think that stands out anytime a program is actively engaging the community. So um, our next question is this, and some of uh, both of you have kind of touched on this a little bit, uh, Nina, with your kind of social emotional um, uh, results with, with students at Barrington, but can you point to a system, tool, or resources that your district or school uses to recruit students in C into CTE programs? Is there something specific that works for you? And maybe there's some things that don't work too, but uh, can you point to something specific that um, you are doing in, in your district? I can go straight to what really works. It's those one-on-one -on -one conversations with a trusted adult. That's that would work. I mean, we have flyers. We have one of the most gorgeous posters you will ever see walking down. We have the display cases everywhere in front of each CTE classroom. They all look good and the students walk by. And I think the more they walk by, it internalizes that there is something, the CNA lab. Okay, I see it. But really what comes to us is when the students indicate on the social, emotional or survey, I have an interest for it for this. And the adult speaking with them about it saying, do you have further questions? Let's go in. And if it's not the adult, it is the students within the building who hype up the other students. Like, did you see what we built? Are you seeing what we're doing? Did you see I'm going into the elementary classroom and I'm teaching a lesson? This is a student to student conversation is actually often who they trust. It's either the trusted adult who they identify or it's students they trust who gets them interested into the program and the adults have to open the doors for them and let them in. So based on survey results, we identify because when we're talking about our under, um, underrepresented students, they might not be the ones who knock on the counselor's door and say, I'm curious. So oftentimes we have to lure them out. They identify it within surveys and we reach out and we do the recruitment. Nina, I'm just I'm just curious. Um, did you did your district develop that survey specifically, or was that something you kind of borrowed from somewhere else, or maybe a combination where you took some ideas and and then came up with your own? All of the above. We started with EOS in 2015, went with an SEL survey, and next year don't use either of them and are creating our own with those sub questions in between, specifically looking interest, but then also the grit and trusted adults that we get all those questions in there in order to work on the outreach, which often starts in early, already in November. So when they sign up for their classes, we have them in the master schedule working. So that's a quick turnaround time. Nice. Uh, Craig, uh, same question for you. What is there a specific system or tool that your district or school is using? So um, I'll say as, as a, at a, building level, um, but I, I know that what has been developed here at, at Jefferson High School has been rolled out to the other high schools as well, so I, I, I believe they're using it in, in similar ways. Um, what, we, what we have is, is we have almost like a little bit of a scavenger hunt and a, and a um, um, sort of a guide. Um, to guide the students through that um, pathway showcase um, that showcases the CTE um, 
you know, pathways. Um, well, actually, even the other, you know, I mean, all, all pathways um, are showcased. And that culminates in a then a follow up survey after the event. So there's so there's a so there's sort of a, a way that guides the students through that exploration of the pathways, um, but then um, culminates in a in a survey, which then um, gets uh, sent out to the pathway teachers, the CTE teachers, so that they can see what students are actually interested. And then that, um, uh, the counselors then take a look at that and then they can uh, coordinate, um, you know, sort of small group discussions with the teachers. And so um, there's various techniques that'll be used um, each year and, and it can vary from year to year, but basically that's sort of the structure that's in place. And then whether it's a, a small group, um, you know, discussion with the teachers, uh, with the students that are interested, or whether it's just um, multiple one-on-one um, -on -one, uh, discussions uh, that, you know, result from that, from that survey. But yeah, those those are the the structures and sort of the order of of, of how those um, systems are are uh, implemented. Okay, so we're going to move on to our next question, um, and that one is, how do you recruit women students into male dominated career pathways, and vice versa? And Craig, why don't you start out for us? Sure. Well, so. I mean, one of the, one of the most obvious ways is having you know all all the freshman uh, female students going to the auditorium for the panel discussions with the uh, local you know community uh, members, you know engineers, um, you know, automotive manufacturing, you know uh, females from from throughout the the community. Um, that that's one of our our big big events, but. Beyond that, you know, there's there's you know the individual teachers, you know, personal you know um, initiatives, you know, where you know I mean I've I've been a, a coach for many years, and so just the same way that I would recruit, you know, students, you know, um, you know I, I I talk with with the the students, you know, specifically, you know, a lot of the female students, and say, hey, have you thought about, you know, some of these you know, these fields, some of these, you know, um, you know engineering, architecture, um, you know, ha, you know, ha, have you looked in, into that? And, and the, the next, you know, sort of logical step that I encourage the students to do is to consider, you know, not, not necessarily going into the classroom, although there are opportunities to go in, and see the classroom, um, because we do have classroom tours and different things, but specifically, um, you know, with a lot of the female students, I'll say, you know, here's an invitation. Come to an after-school club event. See what we do in club, and that will give you a feel for what we do in, in the classroom. Um, you know, I teach, I teach mechanical engineering, uh, which is heavily robotics-based. Um, um, I teach the architecture and civil engineering. And so, I'll, I'll, I'll tell the students, I'll say, you know, you don't necessarily want to choose a pathway just, just by, by saying, well, it sounds, you know, the name sounds interesting, right? That's not enough. I, I, I say, you know, see it firsthand. What do we do in architecture club? And meet the students in architecture club. Um, what do we do in the robot, the various robotics teams? Um, and that's going to give you an idea of what's in the classroom and talk with those students. Because what I have found is year after year after year, uh, near, near the end of the year, I'll, I'll take a look at my roster, my class lot roster, and then I'll, I'll look at my, my club rosters and I'll go and start, you know, kind of highlighting, you know, kind of, kind of circling and saying, all right, is there a correlation between grades? And year after year after year, the, the engineering students that are involved um, with uh, with the clubs, you know, al almost almost you know you know a hundred percent, you know, not quite a hundred percent, but almost a hundred percent of those students are my top students. And 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 I want to point something out. 
because you might say, well, gee, you know, what happens to all the students that are not top students? Well, these students become the top students. And, I, and that's an important differentiation. I had a student who was in my after school clubs for four years. And um, his freshman year, he was failing almost all classes. He was, he was planning on dropping out of school, had no interest in really anything, and discovered my clubs, started enjoying what we were doing in, you know, after school in the clubs, and by his sophomore, junior, and senior years, he was by far one of the top students I had, that I've ever had. And so that that club component, I really can't, you know, emphasize enough how, how significant that is um, to, to seeing success, not only in, in recruitment, but just in success, you know, individual successes, you know, on the individual student, student uh, level. Correct. No doubt the CTSOs, the, their, the participation and of students into those organizations plays a big difference. And I know that uh, you even send uh, female students who are part of those clubs to do some of the reach out into classrooms. So I know that um, that is a key um, strategy that you use and uh, it seems successful in what you're doing because I've, I've witnessed it firsthand. Nina, um, we're gonna go to you uh, on this one. What, what are you guys doing in, in in a strategy to recruit women students to male-dominated careers or vice versa? Mm -hmm. Often through our surveys, we found that there are barriers for the students. Like they knew the classes existed, but they reflected and I'm like, yeah, I know it's existed, but I didn't think it was for me. So this is very reflective and say, it didn't know it was for me. That's where the extra outreach is coming in. And when you hear over time, when something like, is so male dominant as a female you often don't even consider it for me because years and years and years have taught you it is not for you so by just one person coming to you and say hey try it that might not be enough up to six times that outreach has to happen from a trusted adult that they start believing oh that could be for me so just because we're reaching out once and saying, but we have done it, is not enough. When we're talking about underrepresented, and I'm counting as women or male as underrepresented in a field where they're not the dominant one, we have to put in the extra efforts. The other thing that I'm learning from surveys is also that often students want to see themselves in that field. So for example, we have in our PLTW, in our PLTW class, a teacher of color, a female teacher of color. So by having her up there, female students of color could see themselves, oh, she's doing it, I could be doing that. So hiring the diverse population is essential for students to see themselves that they could be doing it. Another thing what we have tried, but I'm going to let you guys also know, it did not work very well, but maybe you guys can do it better. We called it take a peek. So we recruited our underrepresented students and allowed them to take a peek in those classes before they registered for classes. And we reached out, but it did not work. So we might have had eight out of 100 students take us up on that offer. So please go ahead, do it and do it better. Um, somehow I think it might work better when they can go in groups so they feel more comfortable instead of going in one-on-one. -on -one. But our staff is like, we don't want too many kids in our class, so that's something we have to grow on. Another thing what really works well is maybe not committing to a class right away, but Craig, you mentioned it with multiple clubs. So we have girl code, we have educator rising, we have robotics. So that might be a little bit low stakes of something you might be interested, but you're not sure is to get the students involved in clubs and recruit for those. So these are the four things we are doing actively to recruit underrepresented. Nina, no doubt that uh, hit, you know hitting the kids six times uh, and, and having conversations with them uh, sounds like a fantastic strategy. So um, something for for those to think about. So our next question on our panel is, what discussions are happening with staff around special populations and career and college recruitment efforts into CTE? 
And Nina, we'll start with you. Sorry, my boss just called, I had to push him away. Um, so what we having, we have an equity team and our equity team is a team who seep through the data and to look for our students with um, who are underrepresented with those interests. So they are the ones reaching out, talking to the trusted adults. So it's not just the counseling team. We have about a little under 3000 students and they're gonna help out with that. In an effort for that, our Ben Rodriguez is our assistant principal. He is working with our CTE teachers. They are meeting once a month on that and constantly revamping and thinking, how can we do our showcase night a little bit different? How, what are we doing to recruit? He's the one who's really sitting down with them, looking what they need. He's the one funding the grants and looking for what do we need for grant funding to get uh, information in and, um, uh, let me see. Sorry, my principal is still texting me. Maybe, Craig, you can take on. So I'm going to give him a call back. I apologize for that. Craig, Craig go ahead. Uh, again, the question is, what discussions are happening with staff around special populations and career and college recruitment efforts in CTE? So the nice thing in, in my building, um, and, and, and I believe across the entire district in general, but um, in my building, I, I can obviously speak to, to this very specifically and say that what's one of the things that's been very successful is that the scheduling um, that's been uh, done over the past uh, several years uh, at this point, uh, quite a few years, um, we have come in planning time. And so um, the, the teachers, um, you know, in, in CTE have a common planning time. So we, we meet together once a week and, and have these type of discussions. Uh, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll have other discussions too, of course, you know, um, you know, other initiatives. But, you know, one of the things that we do, um, you know, have as, as a weekly, um, monthly, you know, topic is, is exactly this, you know, how, how do we, how do we um, recruit? How do we bring these special populations into CTE? Um, we have we have a great great bunch of CT, uh, CTE teachers here at Jefferson, and they they really do care about you know reaching out to these um, special populations. So so that's an ongoing conversation that we have, um, you know, as often as as, as weekly, um, you know. Some, some, sometimes we'll miss a week on, on touching on that topic only because there's something, you know, some event or some other critical, you know, thing that comes up. But, you know, it's, it's nearly, nearly a, a weekly topic, um, you know, throughout the school year. And, and again, from those, those discussions um, come the, um, the surveys, the, the coordination of, of making the, the, the women's, uh, the women in CTE event, you know, better, you know, reaching out to the community members, um, who's going to contact, you know, who, who, um, who should we invite, you know, all, all those type of, you know, um, discussions are, you know, are being had, you know, weekly, um, you know, throughout the year, um, even, even over the summer, you know, we'll have um, some CTE uh, meetings, uh, not as many, but, you know, uh, we'll, we'll have, have even some summer meetings where we'll, be brainstorming, you know, ideas on, on, you know, um, you know, of course, one of the topics being how do we recruit, you know, these special populations. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's ongoing. Um, you know, what have we learned from past events? How, what, you know, what should we try, you know, to improve that, you know, for next year, um, for next semester, um, for next week, whatever the case may be. Nina, we're going to come back to you and, and allow you to get a better answer on this one because I know you were disrupted. Sorry about that. Um, I think what Craig said, the key thing is for staff to have time. Most of the staff who is teaching career uh, at CTE classes, they know that their job depends on the enrollment and they are very aware of it. So I'm not necessarily sure if constantly telling them, oh, we've got to recruit. They know that and they are the ones going out there and they are the ones recruiting and they do it they just do it because it's part of the job they're teaching and the passion they have for that job. So just giving them time and supporting them financially with what they need through grant funding or through creative spending and to, through supporting them, like Ben made awesome posters, but they just need time discussions. And the other thing, what we are really working on, 
to not step on one another. Because sometimes you're recruiting the same students. Um, don't step on one another, kind of coordinate it. We are all in this together as CTE program, or even as all electives, we are in this together and we are recruiting them. They just need a little bit um, through our equity training on uh, information on how to reach out to certain populations, because you only see, you see everything through the lens of your lived experience. So we have done some extensive equity training with our, with our staff as well to see, okay, reaching out only once might work for one population, but not for all. So don't give up, keep on working. Here's what they are looking for. Here's the support they have. And just do a little bit of training on that as well. All right. So we're going to go to our next question, which is, how do you get employers involved in the conversation of recruiting students into non-traditional careers? I can uh, start. Don't yeah, know. I'm sorry, Nina. Um, so what we have set up is we are actually having our professional networks come in. So for each of our CTE courses, of CTE programs, we actually reached out to the community and asked them to be part of our panel. So once a year, we are meeting with a minimum. It depends on where we are. And we're just going to inform um, them, the experts in our community of business. This is what we currently offer to our students. What do you think? And man, there come some variations of things coming back for people who are actually within those careers and saying, this is great, this is bad. And it is very helpful for our teachers to hear that. And it is very helpful for us to hear that and see where do we need to guide our curriculum, our courses, our investments to get the students ready for the careers beyond high school. So we do that at least once, uh, once a year, again, at some courses differently. We have usually about 20 to 30 um, which, re which ranges from our assistant superintendent to the teacher from within our school. We also have students involved. And then hopefully we can recruit up to 10 businesses or staff or people within the community coming in. So that really has helped and that builds the bridges with going out with our internships to go out into the workforce and work with the employers. Great. Th thank you, Nina. Craig, uh, what about you? What are what are you, uh, is Jefferson High School doing with employers? So, so we have a lot going on with with that, and and it, it it's at all different levels within the school district. So, um, as part of our um, academy uh, model um, in the district, we have a district level um, group of of community members that have been recruited to you know, be part of, of this team. And then at the individual um, high school building level, then those, those businesses that are involved at the district level um, send um, some of their um, you know, individual um, you know, employees, you know, team members to the high schools um, for for usually, um, now the, you know we've just come off of uh, you know some unusual years here with uh, COVID, but usually um, monthly meetings at the building level. So all the high schools, but again, I'm, I'm going to speak specifically to how Jefferson does it, but I, I know it's district wide in general. But here at Jefferson, you know, we'll have um, each of the um, academies. Uh, within the building will have a meeting with uh, the community members that are part of the, um, the, the academy uh, support team. And so the support team is, is made up of, you know, engineers, automotive specialists, aerospace, um, you, know, you know, specialists, um, uh, manufacturing, and, and that's just, that's just in, in, in our one academy. And then if you look at the other academies, you have you have you know finance, accounting. Um, you have you know uh, all, all the others. You know, and so um, so this has really really been a great model um, with it at the highest level within the district, and then at the more building um, level. Because then what what we have is we have all these community members that um, you know understand what's at stake here. At, you know, with our students and 
are coming out to, to our high schools and sitting down um, and meeting with the teachers and students. Uh, students are, are invited. Um, and so students can also attend. Um, parents can also attend. And, and with all that, with, with all that support, it's really, really been, been significant. Well, what do I mean? Well, for example, um, if we want to see, um, you know, an increase in, in attendance, if we want to see an increase in, in, in grades, um, it's bringing the entire community together to brainstorm ideas and then let the community uh, volunteer resources. And so, for example, um, there was an in initiative that was um, discussed and, and, and funded by some of these community members where they said, hey, we can, we'll donate to tool toolboxes. We'll donate some tools. And then let's have that as a, um, a, a prize um, for an, you know, one of the initiatives. And I, I forget if that one was attendance-based or if it was one of the academic-based ones, but you know, well, we have numerous you know, things like this. And so the toolboxes were just one of, of many of these types of, of initiatives that come out of this, this, um, this community involvement. Um, and then of course, uh, planning some of these events where you know, the, 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 the women engineers and, and, and manufacturers coming out and having the, the panel discussion you know, you know, is, is supported by these types of, of, of uh, monthly discussions that we have with, with our um, academy support teams. So Craig, um, I, I think what you brought up was really important also is kind of ce is celebrating students. And I know those conversations take place where it's not just the uh, AP and higher level students, it's, it's celebrating those students that are most improved or who are making an attempt to grow. Uh, and I think that's a key component when talking about recruitment for non-traditional students is some of them are just growing and uh, need that extra push um, to get that opportunity. And, that, and so rewarding them with, you know, tools or uh, something that's going to get them looking at a, a, a special career that maybe they wouldn't consider. I think that's a, a really innovative technique. So um, our, we got one last question and um, you kind of alluded to it, Craig. So we're going to start with you first is, what discussion or activities are planned around parents, adults, parents and or adults talking to students about CT or non-traditional careers? So um, I, I talk with parents all the time and you know, I really enjoy talking with parents. Um, you know, I, I think you know, sometimes it surprises the students. You know, you know, they, they, they see me always talking to you know, parents and um, but I, I invite parents to all sorts of uh, events that, that I have. You know, I, I've I've had I've had parents, um, you know, that I said, "Hey, you want to hop on the bus with us and come with us?" You know, to you know to to one of our robotics competitions. Uh, oh, you want to hop on the bus and and you know and 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 you know tour um, one of you know one of our local you know. Um, uh, businesses that I'm taking students to, um, you know, what, what, and I guess I should say, um, and I know this would probably have fallen under one of the other topics, but, you know, I, I just kind of came to mind. One of the other initiatives that I think is worth pointing out is the sophomore site visits, and this is a um, district-wide initiative here where all sophomores um, who have already chosen, because by, by the time you're a sophomore, you've chosen a pathway uh, to follow here, in, in, at least in the Rockford uh, schools. And so you already know whether you're, 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 you're going to focus on engineering or you're going to focus on business, you're going to focus on art or whatever, uh, computer science, et cetera. And so the sophomore site visits um, are a, a major initiative to, you know, once the students have chosen um, their, their career interest, um, now let's get them actually into the businesses. And so um, uh, I'll take every year, I'll take students to um, local um, 
you know, software developing companies, you know, for my computer science students. I'll, I'll take my engineering students to the local civil engineering and, and architecture uh, and mechanical engineering um, and aerospace um, engineering uh, companies. Um, spend the entire day touring, talking with the engineers, seeing what it's like to be in that environment. Uh, one of the things that I tell both, you know, parents and students is that the reason that students by and large choose to get jobs at McDonald's and Burger King and Taco Bell and you know name name any other fast food or, or Walmart, right? The reason that they're they're getting those jobs is not because they're the best jobs. It's because they've all been to those places. They they they've stood in line um, you know at McDonald's waiting to order and as as they're waiting to order they're looking at, you know, they're looking behind the person taking the orders and seeing, oh yeah, there's someone cooking, oh, there's someone over at the drive up window. And they're, they can picture themselves doing those things. But one of the things that I always point out to my students is that there's better jobs out there in all sorts of careers. And the only reason you guys aren't, you know, applying for those is because you don't know they exist. You, you can't picture yourself doing it because you, you've never, You've never seen it. And, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll point out, I'll say, on this particular street in, in Rockford, ha, ha, you know, think about the businesses that you're familiar with. And, you know, the, you know again, they'll, they'll say, oh, yeah, there's a McDonald's there, there's a Taco Bell. And I say, yeah, but how, how about all those other buildings that you, you drive past and you don't even take a second class at, glance at? Those are the be those have better, better job opportunities, you know, by and large. Um, but but they have no idea what's behind those doors. And so those, those sophomore site visits are, are huge. And so I invite parents to all, all the events throughout out the year. In fact, I even invite parents to come in and sit in the classroom if you want. I say, come, come, come in and take a look, see what we do. Come, in, come after school to the clubs. And so I, I can say at least, you know, for, for myself, parents are always invited. And, and, and they know that. And whenever I bump into parents, I, you know, I'm always, you know, if I see them at a basketball game or at a track meet or, or at a cross country meet or, or, or at whatever, you know, event, you know, um, you know some, uh, show in, in the theater, you know, when, when I see those parents, I'll, I'll try to keep making those connections, talking with them, letting them know how their students are doing, um, encouraging them and, and inviting them, inviting them to, you know, to any, anything and everything. You know, whatever's, whatever's on my calendar, I'm, I'm letting those parents know. Um, I, I, I'll send out um, newsletters um, through, um, you know, various methods of um, you know, Google Classroom more so now, but, it, you know, it used to be um, uh, more so at, at Moto. And, you know, I, I, would, I would send out messages through at Moto um, on, a, on a weekly, if not almost daily uh, basis to parents. And you know, constantly inviting them, constantly keeping them informed of what's going on, and and, and I know that you know I'm not getting 100 percent you know of parents you know necessarily um, reading you know what I send out or you know or even following up you know or or, or coming to the things I invite them to, but but that's not the point. The point is for me to at least reach out to them you know on a regular basis, and and the ones that do show up you know you know interact, you know, I interact with them as, as, as much as possible. And so that's been a huge success. I mean, I have on the wall, um, I, 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 on the walls of my room, and I'm kind of looking at it over there right now, I have, I have, you know, pictures of, for each of the clubs, of, of different events, different things we've done. And, you know, a lot of them are our students, you know, student only, you know, photos, but I'm looking right now and I see one where a parent and uh, her daughter came out and they're in an inflatable raft in a pond uh, uh, helping to retrieve and then uh, uh, data loggers, read the data off and then redeploy them. And, uh, and, and, I, and I told the parents, I said, hey, you're invited, come, come on out here. You, you wanna be part of, of citizen science? We'll, you know, we'll do that. I see another photo where uh, I have a couple of parents that are helping dig in the dirt with the students. Um, to, uh, to do a, a prairie restoration. Um, I see, let's see, I see some underwater uh, robotics photos where um, some photo on the bus where, you know, some of the parents are sitting there with, 
with uh, with some some of the students. Um, actually, sort of parents kind of were clustered together, and the students were clustered together. They weren't weren't sitting necessarily with their their son or daughter, but um, but still, you know, it's it's these these great opportunities. Um, that I try to have it as often as possible. So, you know, anywhere I can invite a parent, um, I do. And, and that has worked, you know, really quite well. Thank you, Craig. Um, certainly that brings up uh, some questions about how to address the changes in what a PT, uh, traditional PTSO is and um, how, how there are changes going on in social media that, um, and, and other things in society that, Maybe that traditional model doesn't work, but um, Nina, what are some things that uh, you, you guys are doing uh, around uh, addressing parents and, and including them in this talk about uh, non-traditional careers? Mm -hmm. um, for all parents, we have those two big events, which is our freshman night where the freshmen are coming in in January and picking their electives. So that's definitely one where we invite all parents in and the students and showcase the course offerings we have, the clubs we have, the activities we have. So that's definitely one where we draw a lot of parents in. Due to COVID, it has gone away a little bit, but now hopefully when, you know, January rolls around of 2023, we are back in person and can showcase all the wonderful programs we have. The other one where we draw parents is then in April with our showcase that is open to the public, that's open to all, and the majority of parents come who have their students showcase something, so they're already in the courses at that point. The other thing what we are doing is we have a family liaison specifically for our underrepresented population, and they do a lot of one-on-one -on -one outreach, explaining, recruiting, and they have the time to be on the phone and um, more talking about the courses, the course offerings, um, to in the language, um, often in Spanish, are those phone conversations explaining what those are. So those are the two two big things which are more to a broader audience. When we are specifically looking at underrepresented students and involving their parents, every time when we start our outreach in October, November, the parents also get a phone call and a letter saying, congratulations, you are, your child has been selected to take one of these challenging classes. Again, we are considering any challenging class to be a class which is post high school experience and we are identifying the students as underrepresented who have exhibited one of those five skills, grit, interest in the course, GPA, test scores, or teacher recommendation. So even if one teacher says, I believe this kid could take a post high school course, they are in my list as long as they meet those criteria, and that's the automatic outreach that the parents receive a phone call and an end a letter saying, this is it. Feedback from the parents has been, oh, I didn't know we save money. That has been the most interesting one when they, the moment they hear it's a pathway, they already get their certificate in high school. They receive college credit in high school. They already have something in hand before leaving high school. They are right there. You have the parents, they are listening and they are having those conversations at home to get the students interested. So we're doing that only for our underrepresented students. We might be expanding that, but we are usually targeting about 150 students out of close to 3000 who are getting the personalized attention as well as the parent communication. Thank you, Nina. That that uh, dollar savings for those families is key as well. So um, we're going to move into the end of our presentation and just wanted to throw it out to all of our participants. If you have questions, feel free to share those either in the chat or if you want to just hop right on and um, ask some questions. Um, please feel free to do so. I'm giving a little more wait time because of uh, the the digital behind this. So uh, making sure that if people want to type some questions in. All right, so we have one from Chris. Uh, when looking at community presentations, we had some initial challenges with the thoughts that CTE would remove programming from our local community college. Initially, folks did not see the partnerships. Um, 
I think early on, Chris, a lot of communities went through that. So um, under Luke Allen, what resources would be helpful for your CTE student organizations to help them recruit? Um, Craig, I'm going to send that over to you first since you you really focused on the CTSOs. What resources would be helpful for your CTE student organizations to help them recruit? Um, for the student for the student organizations, the, the clubs? Yes. What resources? So, um, you know, I, I do a, um, a lot of grant writing. Um, and so um, I have an enormous uh, amount of resources that have come through grants. So I mean, I cannot, you know, you know, thank the, the grant organizations enough for, for all that they've, um, you know, allowed um, for my students. I mean, um, I mean, if, if I were to uh, rotate my camera around, which I guess maybe this is an opportunity to, um, I have my classroom currently, so oh, there's, there's one of our drones that's made of custom carbon fiber, um, uh, custom aluminum, you know, extrusions. There's one of our 3D printers. And I know it's hard to see with the black monitors, but there's a bunch of black cases. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, six uh, drones that are um, actually one's out. It's an orange one over there. Um, six other drones over there. I have RoboMasters in the far back. The back cabinets are full of uh, VEX robotics. Um, in the center of the room um, is parts for the most advanced robot that we're currently attempting or have ever attempted to build. Um, this is a blue, uh, based on blue robotics parts. Um, this is an underwater robot that can go down 900 feet, um, has underwater claws. Um, it's using Raspberry Pis. Um, on the other side of the room, let's see what's over there. Um, yeah, oh, we've got, well, harder to see. Here, there's a 3D printer made out of wood that we actually designed and built. We have, I have a laser cutter in the back room. And so um, that back room back there, that back door. So the point is, I mean, a $20,000 laser cutter, um, five um, laser, uh, five 3D printers, um, plus a sixth one if you count the one that we actually laser cut ourselves and programmed. Um, all the drones, all the um, RoboMaster um, um, driving robots, lane robots, the underwater robot robotics parts. I mean, that's that's you know tens of thousands of dollars, um, and that's all through grants. And so that's a lot of grant writing. Um, I've I've been told that I you know I I've you know done some of the most grant writing you know you know on average you know um, of, of almost any other teacher. Um, not to say that you know some of the other teachers haven't got some big large large items. I mean our auto shop has obviously had some you know large grants for some really expensive equipment. But um, just you know on a regular basis, I mean I'm constantly writing grants for this. So. That's one of the one of the biggest the biggest things you know that has really helped you know our clubs is you know and 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 the classes and, and there's the synergy be, be, between it you know I may write a grant for something that I specifically want to use with my with my clubs but then I can go and introduce it a little bit you know in in a class period and, and it may be you know connected with something, you know, a topic that we're, we're discussing or vice versa. It could be something that, you know, I've written a grant for, for the classroom, um, but then it's something that we can then roll over and pull, pull back out after school and then work with our clubs. Um, and so that's, that's been huge. The other thing that's really been, been, been a huge help with our clubs is that, um, and, and again, even, in the, even with what I'm going to say, this is both with our after school clubs and within the classroom, you know, both benefit from this. And that is, um, you know, staying connected with our community members and, you know, being aware of, you know, events, being aware of um, competitions. And so for, for example, I mean, I'll take, um, you know, my architecture students Again, primarily the club students, but again, I don't, I'm not going to go and tell someone, you know, well, gee, you're in my architecture class, you're not invited, you know, you know, just because you're not regularly attending our club. And so, again, this is benefiting our, our, our classroom students as well as our club students to go to a, um, an evening, um, 
you know, AIA, uh, local AIA, uh, you know, um, American Institute of Architects um, event um, that is being hosted where they'll invite our, our local, um, our, our high school chapter of the AIS, American Institute of Architecture students, so they'll, they'll invite them. And of course, I, I extend that invitation a little bit further and say, well, hey, if you're in my class, um, come and join us. And I'll even, I'll even go one step further. I'll even take that opportunity to invite students that are not in my class, that are not in my clubs, and I'll say, hey, you know, why don't you come to this event and, and you know, kind of see, you know, see the, the, the professional women, you know, the president of the AIA, um, uh, who, who, who is a woman, um, and, you know, see her, you know, present um, tonight at this event, and, you know, see some of the other architects, you know, and civil engineers, and, and, and what other, whatever other community members, you know, may be at some of these events, and so, um, that's, that's been huge. And so, um, I've taken students to the national, um, AIS conference, American Institute of Architecture Students Conference. Now, my high school is one of only nine high schools in the nation that have a chapter in the AIS. All of our other peer groups, other, other than, than those nine, are, you know, the Harvard University chapter, the University of Illinois chapter, Urbana-Champaign, the UIC chapter, the IIT chapter, the Iowa State chapter. You know, so our peer group is actually at the university level. And so that has been, you know, incredible for my students. Because when we go to those national events, um, which they're, they come around to Chicago on a fairly regular basis. I mean, it moves around the country, but, you know, whenever they're coming back to Chicago, you know, we'll, we'll spend that, you know, that week, uh, a little less than a week, you know, four, four or five days, I think, um, at that conference. And I've taken students into Chicago and we'll stay there overnight. And, you know, they'll tell me that that's, you know, that one event was one of the most incredible events ever. And, and again, we're, we're, we're there with thousands of students from across the country. And, they're, they're all college students. And so they're able to talk to my, my high schoolers and, you know, and, and let them know, hey, here's what it's like when you, when you get to college, here's what to expect. And then obviously when I'm meeting, you know, you know having my students meet with the AIA, you know, chapter, the, the, the professional chapter um, here in Rockford. Now, now they're hearing, you know, hearing from the actual professionals. So they're hearing from the college level, the professional level, um, you know, that, that's, that's huge. So, so yeah, so grants, um, and then you know just that that, that staying connected and meaningful connections with the community. You know, it's it's not enough to just say, well, we, we've we've checked something, you know, checked off a box, you know, okay, that we we've done this. It's having those meaningful connections. You know, it, it's not just making a phone call. It's not just having a quick conversation. It's having those constant, you know, conversations. So um, Craig. Real quick, uh, yeah. it sounds like the two main focus on that question is the money issue, whether it's grants or getting support from your district, but also that community issue um, of developing those relationships, uh, getting them to participate and, and getting them to advocate for your group uh, is key. So I want to make sure that we have time for uh, Nina to answer some questions. So um, one for Nina was, do you use Perkin funds that targeted outreach uh, to parents? My counterpart now oversees the Perkin fund, so no on that one. He would use the Perkin funds a lot of for the equipment within the classrooms. So that's where it goes. And once the students are in the classroom, they see the amazing things happening from the Perkins grants. Outreach really takes passion and time. I have a bunch of passionate people who are there and seeing inequities in the building and who want to do something about it. And that group grew from a group of two to a group of 25. So when you have 25 passionate people about outreach, that's definitely helping. And when you're an administrator, it would be great to have the time compensated in any way. For example, if you have those parent meetings after school, if you have those evenings, so anything like that would be wonderful, but we are using either our extra duty pay, or in some cases, I also work with our title funded. We are Title I school, so we use title grants as well to get our at-risk and underrepresented students in there. But just finding the right people is really key. 
Thank you, Nina. Uh, one that kind of sticks out from Jody. She says, how do you get students with disabilities enga engaged in CTE? And I think that's one of the key questions that we, we've kind of almost gone around. But um, I'm curious to hear, Nina, uh, what are some things that you're doing with uh, students with uh, disabilities? So right now we have, we got very, very lucky and we passed a referendum for multiple, multiple millions of dollars to really outfit all of our learning spaces to be wheelchair access accessible. That includes our theater where they can go up into the lights down to our woods room. So we are really spending money to make it all accessible for one. So I think the first thing I would just say, are the rooms and is the equipment accessible to all students? And if the answer is no, you need to start there and make it accessible for students. Otherwise you're recruiting and the student comes up to all the wonderful equipment which is out there, but they can't access it. Um, so we have not necessarily made special recruitments. They just fall into our pocket. We just reach out to all of our students which meets the requirements for underrepresented. Um, and I'm gonna look further into that because that is really an interesting question if we are putting up barriers for our students. So thank you for making us aware of it. Craig, maybe you have a better or different strategy. Oh, yeah. Well, so one, one thing I'll say, and, and as I was kind of showing my classroom, you might be wondering, boy, why is all, all that, you know, equipment out? Well, I have a summer engineering camp that I've been um, having in my classroom every summer for the past over 10 years now. And, um, you know, one, one of the things, and I'm going to use, use this as sort of, you know, my, my talking point, but this, this kind of goes throughout you know, the rest of my classes and clubs as well. But, um, you know, every summer I have these engineering camps and I always, you know, tell, you know, tell the district, you know, as they're setting out the, you know, the signups, you know, I'm willing to have every level of student and I hope that that's who, who will sign up for this. And, um, you know, and I've, and I've had people over there say, well, how, how is that possible? How, how, what, what do you mean? And I, and I said, well, you know, the district likes to have, you know, in my summer engineering camp be a high school only. But I say, you know what? Let's have it be, you know, middle school through high school. You know, and I've even said, you know what? If there's only any elementary school students that want to join us, let them come too. Um, on my robotics team, the 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 competition that, that we uh, compete in is there is elementary school you know teams there's middle school teams there's high school teams there's college teams you know my team from Jefferson is is unique in a couple of ways first of all it's the district team so yes it's it's housed here in my classroom at Jefferson but it is officially also the RPS 205 team. It's the only team. I, I've tried to promote getting other teams at the other high schools, and they said, no, no, you, you, you've got the district team. You know, it's, it's, it's in good hands. Keep, keep it going. And one of the things that's unique about that team, just like the summer engineering camps, is that I say I want everyone to be there. So I had a parent call, call the school district and, and, and say, I have a kindergartner over at this elementary school and he wants, you know, he seems to be, you know, into engineering type, you know, hands-on opportunities. You know, that's what he's looking for. Is there anything that he can participate in? And fortunately, the person who, who answered the phone downtown, um, you know, was well-versed in what was available in, in the district. And they said, hey, why don't, why don't I put you in contact with, uh, with Craig Stenberg over at Jefferson? And he's got multiple opportunities for your elementary school students. And what ended up happening, he came to our after school clubs, worked uh, with our, our underwater robotics team, who um, came to our summer engineering camp. And again, um, you might be saying, well, how is this, how is this related to um, our special needs students? Well, I, I look at it this way. If I can um, create a program that challenges high school students at the level they're at, challenges middle school students at the same time at the level they're at, challenges elementary school students at the level they're at, and not to mention, you know, all, all the numerous special needs, uh, you know, students that, 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 that are also, you know, involved, you know, I, I look at it this way, you know, 
if a student can do the engineering calculations using calculus, great. I, I told them, I'll teach you, I'll teach you a calculus based. Students that um, can only handle trigonometry because that's their, their, their experience level. Okay, I'll, I'll teach you how to calculate um, you know, the engineering calculations using you know, trigonometry based calculations. Students that aren't even close to that, you know, that level of, of, of math, I say, no problem. I, 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 can, I can give you some general rules of thumb that don't require that, that kind of calculations that are more of just approximations that will get you in the ballpark. So here's some tables, here's some charts. Let me teach you how to use those. And those can give you some, some ways of, of being able to work through that. So, um, so at least you know, on, a, on an individual level, um, that's on a personal level, that's what I, I do for, for my students. And I have students, oh, another thing, and, I, and this is really important. I'll have students, again, after school clubs, during the class time, or during my summer engineering camp. And, you know, they'll say, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I can do this. You know, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm reluctant, right? I, I'm, I'm not sure I wanna do this. And, you know, I, I had a student that was severely autistic. I had a student that, you know, had, had some other, had some fine motor skill issues. And I said, hey, that's okay. I want you to try it, Tr you know, try, Try to fly the drone, okay? Try to, you know, okay, maybe you can't take the smallest screws and screw those in, but I bet you can take those really large bolts over there and, and, and get those in, right? And so I find, I look for opportunities for success rather than, you know, rather than saying, well, everyone has to be at this level, regardless of where they're at. Um, you know, what, what, are, what are the opportunities that every student naturally, you know, can succeed at, and, and that and that's what that's what that's what I find. And I, and I also, those personal relationships are key, Craig, and yeah. um, I, thank you for sharing those. Um, we got a few more questions. We got to get through. Uh, this one's for Nina. Do any of your schools get any employer organizations involved in the panel discussions or student recruitment? Employer organizations give me more info before I give you the wrong answer. Um. um I think just employers um, might be the the intention. Michael, do you want to? Sure. Uh, I'm thinking like the Illinois Manufacturing Association or anything like that. I'm looking because we had all those different professional network committees where we invited. We might have invited and not for all have necessarily shown up. So I was at the ones because I'm teaching the education classes for the education one. So we did not necessarily invite the Board of Education from ISPE or anything like that. But we, I know we had, um, for our business courses, we had reached out, but the way we did, and I think we can keep on improving of it, just ask the people we know, who do you know who would wanna be on it? So I think that's something room for improvement. I do, am not aware that we have reached out to those professional organizations at this point. We might have for some. Our horticulture had a big meeting um, Luke, you were there. Do you remember if we reached out to? Uh, yeah, and the uh, when we started that advisory committee for Barrington's horticulture and urban agriculture food production and environmental science program, there were quite a few employers and nonprofits from the community there who did contribute ideas for recruitment uh, into the classes uh, and participation in the student organization. Uh, the CTSO is actually going to be expected and required um, in those classes. <clears throat> Thank you. So I'm going to hand this one over to uh, Jason, but uh, Myra Tim said, I'm a small business owner with my own CTE program and curriculum mentorship, specifically focusing on careers in trade and apprenticeship. How, who, and where can small business owners, employers, and networks with uh, schools, districts, and leaders for recruitment. So I'm going to hand that one off to uh, Jason Klein. Yeah. So I I think this one does go with the with the last question. And and the truth is, typically at the local level, uh, regionally or specifically at a school district, I wouldn't expect statewide organizations to be involved. I mean, statewide organizations like the Illinois Manufacturers Association, for example, are are made up of um, 
local businesses, right? And, and in local communities. And so that is their membership. And so um, that is the level at which we, we really want to encourage um, school districts and their partners, community and business partners uh, locally to work together. So how does a business, uh, someone in a business get involved? Well, um, one way is to is to simply pick up the phone and, and call a school district office or, or a high school specifically. And again, we very much want these and we've heard We've heard from both Rockford and Barrington today, from both Craig and Nina about not this not just being uh, an initiative for ninth through twelfth graders, but but extending down through middle school and into elementary school, and 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 that that's wonderful. And and increasingly, the State Board of Ed CTE team wants to support that focus in schools. Um, so, but picking up the phone, calling a school district, it it still does remain primarily. Uh, high school focus in many places. And so um, you can pick up the phone and call a local high school and say, hey, I wanna talk to somebody about getting involved. And hopefully that's a way to get handed off to the right person. Now, who that person is, Illinois has 852 school districts. Um, we have uh, by far the most complex uh, local setup in, in the United States. Um, I, for example, have worked in three school districts in my career, and I've never worked in what's called a unit district, which is what both Rockford and Barrington are. Um, I've worked in two elementary districts with students from early childhood through eighth grade, and one high school district with students in ninth through twelfth grade. And so that kind of complexity does make it hard for people outside the system. Um, but but simply picking up the phone and, and calling that place and saying, hey, who can I talk to about getting involved? I want to support career and technical education, or more broadly, I want to support students move towards uh, careers and what their post-secondary learning will be like. Um, and I hope that in many cases, um, that leads you to the right place. Now, in a specific instance like this question, I'm happy to stay on and have us connect and, and look at what, what might work in your community. I mean, one of the great joys for me about about this job is getting to roll up my sleeves and, and learn about communities across the state that I might have had some knowledge of, or in some cases, no knowledge of, and start to really understand what um, what works in those communities from the people who are there. So um, that would be our, our answer broadly. And again, to piggyback on the previous question, again, it's great where there can be statewide associations involved locally, but really those statewide associations are made up of of local people, of local member organizations, and that's where we can work locally. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Jason, for sharing that. Um, we are at the end of our presentation, and I just want to sincerely uh, thank Nina and Craig for sharing uh, both of their experiences with all of us. Um, I, I think that there are probably a lot of questions still uh, going on in our heads around what can each district do around these initiatives. and um, and so, uh, Craig and Nina, if, if you want to share your email in the chat or share some contact information, I think, you know, um, having some resources for our, uh, uh, um, attendees, if they have questions about some of the things you're doing, Craig, around your CTSOs, I think that, that's important. Nina, you, your programs, uh, at Barrington around social, emotional, and the surveys you're putting on in the the community outreach, just um, top notch. So again, we want to thank you two for presenting with us and answering those questions and uh, and thank all of our participants uh, for, for coming and learning a little bit more about outreach with uh, special populations and non-traditional careers. So with that said, um, thank you all for attending. And if you have not uh, signed in, Rodrigo put a sign in there at the end. So please make sure you sign in, but thank you again for attending and, and we hope to see you again at, at some of these follow-up trainings.